You're listening to Ask Me Anything, a weekly live digital town hall for Calgary Shepherd constituents. Now, here... Hi there, everyone. Welcome to another digital town hall. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, before we get too far into it, hit that share button. Hit subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. As always, these digital town halls, I dual stream them onto Facebook and onto YouTube to try and answer your questions and reach as many constituents in Calgary Shepherd as I possibly can. Now, if you like these digital town halls, click the like button. That helps me quite a bit. It tells me I'm doing uh, the right thing by doing these town halls digitally, especially in this time of the viral pandemic. I think it's really convenient for us to be able to talk to each other over this digital medium. Uh, and if you have any questions for me, put them in the comment section below and I'll try to answer them as we get through it. So let's start right away with Carly. And Carly's asking, in brief, why do all Canadians have to wear masks? When can we reopen the economy? So Carly, I'm gonna begin by showing you a video of Alberta Premier Jason Kenney answering that question during a press conference because I'm gonna build off of what he says. So let's roll the video. If we want to, we wanna do everything we can to avoid widespread disruption of economic and social activity in the future if we get a, a significant second wave. And so one way we can maximize our freedom is through the personal responsibility of using face coverings and masks when we cannot physically distance. So I urge Albertans, if they're in grocery stores, on mass transit, uh, in, in close proximity to others in workplaces, please be considerate. Using a mask is not a sign. I, I see on Facebook some people think it's a sign of subjugation or uh, fear. No, it's not. It's a sign of consideration for others. The mask doesn't actually substantially reduce your chances of getting infected, but it does reduce the chances of you unwittingly. So Carly, there you saw the answer. Uh, this is something I get quite often asked, especially nowadays. So let's start with some numbers. Uh, we have COVID-19 related deaths in Canada, 8,860 as of uh, today, which is July 21st. So I want to make sure that we put this into context. Statistics Canada says that in 2018, the total influenza and pneumonia deaths, so combining the two, uh, the, the regular influenza, the flu, uh, influenza is more serious than the regular everyday flu, but they combine those together and pneumonia, it causes about 8,500 deaths per year, 8,511 specifically in 2018. The Infection Prevention and uh, Control Canada says there's about 1,500 deaths from the flu every year. Um, different sources will give you different numbers, but they kind of they're always in the range of about below 10,000 over 2,000 is what you'll see. Different uh, centers, different groups of doctors who've done the research will report. And while I'm a big believer in not only focusing on the deaths, you gotta also focus on the types of people who are passing away. So typically comorbidity risks, people with other conditions, which then leads back to, should you wear a mask? Should you not wear a mask? Um, I think it should come down to people using their better judgment. Uh, you know, I think it's a sign of politeness for people to wear one. I wasn't wearing a mask at the beginning. Now it's mandatory on aircraft to wear it. I wear it in Ottawa because Ottawa uh, is one of the cities that now requires it. Uh, Ottawa, Toronto, Montreal actually require it when you're entering a building. So now I wear it here and I've started to wear it more often in Calgary as well, especially if we're gonna be indoors in a grocery store. And Carly, I'm gonna disagree with you on one thing. Masks do work. Um, it's not something new that's never been tried before. Mask wearing in Asia, especially Southeast Asia, especially in Taiwan, Singapore, Korea, is very common. It's very common across places. Uh, in mainland China, uh, every flu season that comes, especially in the 2000s, when you look at the news and you follow Southeast Asian news and you look at the pictures, during flu season, during the winter time, people are wearing masks, cloth masks. They're not wearing surgical masks. So masks do work, which is why doctors, when they're doing surgery, wear N95 masks, so high-end masks to make sure that droplets from their mouths don't get into their patients' bodies. Um, one more thing, I just want to roll so everybody at home can see this, and so Carly can see it too. Um, here are some newspaper clippings from previous years. So just so you can see, 
uh, mask wearing was made mandatory at one point. It was This is from an Edmonton newspaper, the Morning Bulletin, reporting that mask wearing is now mandatory. Uh, you can see there was a debate about whether it was logical to wear masks, illogical, whether it made sense. And that's a healthy thing in democracy. Like you don't see government oppressing people. Like I'm going to differ with you here. Uh, this is not an oppression on you to tell you to wear a mask indoors in a public building. Uh, I think it would be ridiculous to tell you have to wear it outdoors. I don't think that makes any sense. Uh, but my personal view is uh, any business should tell you. So if you go to Costco, they may ask you to wear a mask. You go to Walmart, you go to a restaurant um, for pickup, and they may ask you to wear a mask. That is their right as a business. To, it's the same idea as if they tell you, you know, if you're wearing rollerblades or you're not wearing a shirt, you're not going to get service. Uh, in a restaurant or in a business. Same applies, I think, during this pandemic. Uh, no mask, no service. It's the same concept. It, it's not too much to ask uh, for businesses who want to do it. Now, whether it should be made mandatory or not, you should contact your local counselor. That is the best thing to do. I think masks work, uh, especially for asymptomatic cases. It's not gonna help you, uh, prevent you from getting it, but if you have it already and you don't have any symptoms, it'll help prevent the spread to somebody else, which I think is what we all want. And this is not a new debate. This gets debated during every viral pandemic. If it didn't work, then uh, the Taiwanese government wouldn't be mandating, mandating them in certain situations. It wouldn't be a common thing for people to do. And if that helps us reopen the economy, and it's not just reopening economy, that's already going on. The economy wasn't shut down entirely. Some businesses were just deemed non-essential, which I think in retrospect was a big mistake on behalf of the provincial and federal governments to do that. I think in retrospect, a lot of shutdowns, once we review them in, in a broader context, uh, you know, fulsomely with all the facts, all the evidence before us, and there's a healthy debate over whether it worked or not, um, I think on the balance, people will say this was not the best way to go. We should have just told people wear masks, which even um, the Public Health Agency of Canada said not to wear a mask and it changed its mind. Uh, they do work. I wear one. I encourage others to do it too. Uh, but if you're outdoors and you're just walking around and there's nobody around you, I, I think it's, that's perfectly fine not to wear one as well. So that would be my answer to that question. Now, moving on to the next one, Chris and many others have asked me the question, how do you support Canadian companies who are no longer protected under COSMA now that investor state dispute settlement is no longer there? I think in your case specifically, Chris, uh, you actually thought that these ISDS, so the short word for it, you're calling for a moratorium on its application. So as you know, in COSMA, so the new NAFTA 2.0, 1.5, whatever you want to call it, um, they no longer, it'll no longer apply. There's a three-year period, whereas it will still apply and they'll disappear. One area I will disagree with you, though, uh, because you say that there is a, there's a prospect corporations are already planning to use this clause to counter these urgent life-saving actions globally. I see no proof of this, Chris. Actually, I went to look back. There has been 23 cases brought under uh, against Canada since the 1990s in these investor claims. Five are outstanding, so five on top of those 23. One is from Clayton Bilcon, one is from Lone Pine Resources, Inc., one is from Resolute Forest Products, Inc., Tenant Energy, LLC, and Westmoreland Mining Holdings, LLC. And Canada spent more than 95 million legal costs defending itself against investor state claims and it's paid out over 219 million dollars in damages and settlements. I get this from the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. Um, I think these investor state dispute resolution mechanisms have not been abused. I disagree with people who say they have been. I mean, you can just see by the numbers I'm quoting that's less than the one per year since the 1990s. Typically, they involve a case where a company was specifically targeted, most of the time by a provincial government, for a special dispensation in law where they're specifically targeted by a law or by a regulation passed by a province, and then it got litigated uh, in the court. So it hasn't been abused in the past. I see no evidence of it being abused in the future. I'd be willing to change my mind if I saw abuse, but uh, Chris and the many others who've Ask me about this, I, I simply don't see any pending abuse of it having happened in the past or right now. Not that it's been cheap to the taxpayer and legal fees, uh, but again, uh, I, did, I haven't gone to look about how many cases of Canadian companies 
have prosecuted cases in the United States and in Mexico and in other uh, trade agreements in other countries to try to make you know a balancing of accounts on whether it was worth it or not. And of course, you know, there's a difference whether uh, in particular cases those companies also had Canadian employees, they had Canadian investments that they had made. So that's my answer on it. We're going to have to disagree on this one. Uh, Keith and Carl asked me the question. The Prime Minister stated that their government took on debt so that Canadians don't have to, which is laughable. Where is this money coming from? Don't our children have to pay for this? So here's some numbers so to start off the conversation. This year alone, the government predicts a revenue loss of $71.1 billion. We're looking at a $343.2 billion deficit, which is about 49.1% of our debt to GDP ratio. And as the economy will shrink over this year, that uh, percentage debt to GDP ratio is actually going to go up because as your economy shrinks, your debt begins to take up a bigger ratio of the total amount. Uh, Canada has the highest unemployment rate in the G7 right now. We lost our AAA credit rating uh, from one of uh, the rating agencies. We're the only G7 country without a public recovery plan as well. Late last year, the government was already forecasting a $28.1 billion deficit. And it goes on. I mean, the numbers are not pretty right now. Uh, the Bank of Canada is printing money as we speak, uh, partially to make up the, the fact that it can't just loan as much as it wants at the free market. So who's going to pay the money back? You are as a taxpayer and a citizen of this country. Uh, your, our children, our children's children will have to pay back this money. So this is one of the worries that we have is are they going to start canvassing for new uh, revenue sources? Uh, one of the things we saw is a complete uh, denunciation of the CMHC study, uh, paying for a study to look at uh, taxing primary residences. And first time, I think in five years, I've seen the finance minister, Bill Mordo, answer a question directly to say, absolutely not. They are not looking at taxing uh, home residences, principal residences, um, because it is one of the major savings tools that our generation and the previous generation has used. So. That's the interesting part is, at least on this particular tax, they've been absolutely adamant. They're not looking at it. I think they're afraid of the backlash they would see. But it doesn't mean they're not looking at other tax options. And to pay down a $343 billion deficit when the finances of our country are so bad and they have no recovery plan begs the question of when are the tax hikes coming and on whom will they be levied? Or where are the cuts going to come from? Because simply put, when we have a, over a trillion dollar deficit, our economy cannot sustain this, this continuous borrowing. So at some point, the Liberals are going to have to admit that the deficit has to come down. An interesting thing will be is how much uh, reduction in spending will happen and where will the tax increases come from. I haven't seen those numbers. I have filed a bunch of access to information requests, so we're going to find that answer soon enough. The next question comes from Tara. Can you ensure that the Canada-US border remains closed and stop all air travel coming from the USA into Canada? Now, Tara, that's a good question. I actually get lots of questions on both sides. Some people saying, reopen the border, I want to go visit my family, and I want to go across the border to uh, visit uh, or see what my property is like in Arizona, in Florida, because there are many Canadians who are on both sides. Um, so, Tara, it, the border is closed till August 21st, 2020. That negotiation with the government of the United States will happen at that point. Uh, I know I see the same numbers you do. Uh, the government of America, so the United States government, is testing way more people than any other Western government in the world right now, which is why their caseload is so much bigger. The more you test, the more cases you will find. That's simply the way it is. Um, in order for a U.S. citizen or other foreign national who's not an immediate family member of a Canadian citizen or permanent resident to enter Canada from the United States, they have to be uh, asymptomatic, so not coughing, sneezing, any of that at the border. Uh, their entry must not be for a purpose that is optional or discretionary, so no tourists, no visiting. Uh, you can be traveling to Alaska and CBC officers obviously have a lot of leeway in deciding whether you're entering Canada with a good reason for it. And they also have to comply with the requirement to quarantine based on the purpose of travel, intended length of stay, if required to do so under the ordering council that was passed. So Tara, one of the things that's really important to remember here is a lot of Canadians who cross the border every single day to work in America, 
nurses, EMS, doctors, construction workers. I have businesses in the riding who you know ship equipment that require a person to go along with the equipment. Sometimes it's aircraft as well. If we close the border to America entirely, they will close the border entirely to these Canadians who will lose their livelihoods. And the Canadian government simply cannot underwrite the entire free economy in Canada. Uh, our economies with the, with the Americans are so deeply intertwined, it would put a lot of people's livelihoods at risk. And there is a reasonable way to get this done where we only ensure basic travel happens. And I want to see more of the border actually open. So Tara, we're gonna have to disagree on this. I actually want more flights to resume, more repatriation flights and more essential flights to resume. Um, I think it's time to start reopening things. Otherwise, more pilots, more stewardesses will continue to lose their jobs with our ma major airline carriers. And at a certain point, we have to accept that uh, cases of COVID-19 will continue to rise. And the key is not the number of cases, as you mentioned in your email. I'm going to disagree with one other point. The key is not the number of cases. The key is the number of cases that wind up in the ICU. We cannot overwhelm our healthcare system. And there's absolutely no indication that's happening right now. Um, so it's not the number of cases you should be looking at. It's the number of ICU hospitalization. And then we have about 1,100 beds available in Alberta, and I haven't seen it being overwhelmed in any way. So I just want to caution you on that. It's not the cases that matter the most. The next question comes from Blake, and Blake is asking the question, will you support action in order to conserve the interior Fraser River steelhead uh, population? So these are, um, you know, uh, you're specifically calling for the end of the gillnet fishery, uh, a moratorium on it. Uh, this is far outside of the Calgary Shepherd community. First of all, I'm not a member of the government. I, I don't have the power to do any of these things. That's not how it works. Um, it, it works with, you know, and ministers have the power to do these things. And because it is far outside my community, uh, I'm not going to say whether it should be done or shouldn't be done. Because again, I, I represent Ke Calgary Shepherd. I don't represent the Thompson River area fisheries. Uh, and what's happening there. Um, it wouldn't be up to me to decide any of these things. Uh, it and I haven't seen enough information about it, whether it makes any logical sense to do so. I would hope though, that it wouldn't put more Canadians out of work who maybe rely on these types of, um, on these types of fisheries. So uh, Blake, I'm gonna disagree with you. Again, I'm not a member of the government, remember Her Majesty's opposition, and my role is to keep them accountable. And especially during a viral pandemic, uh, we got to make sure we don't cost more Canadians their jobs. Ishan asks me the question, do you support mandatory testing for everyone crossing the borders at traveler's expense? I like that idea. I actually think that idea would help uh, increase confidence for people uh, who are crossing the border and also confidence of Canadians that we can manage our borders effectively. The problem is, Ishan, that the government has completely dropped the ball on securing both uh, serological testing, so testing for antibodies and testing for COVID-19 to have it freely available. In fact, the Alberta government had to move far ahead and ignore Health Canada regulatory process to procure the machines and begin to te mass testing. Alberta has tested, our provincial government has tested more people than any other government in Canada, which is incredible. Um, but I would support the CPSA doing the testing and simply charging people at the border saying, uh, we're going to charge you this money. You can maybe recoup it from your business. That would be a great idea. That would be very useful. So Isha, I agree with you. The problem is the federal government hasn't done anything to uh, broaden and expand and uh, ensure that there is mass testing available through the CBSA, through Transport Canada for all visitors, uh, for all workers coming into Canada for whatever the reason is. Uh, we're still requiring people to basically self-isolate for 14 days. The next question comes from James. How can a government award a contract to a Chinese company for screening entrance? So these are the machines that screen you. You know, sometimes you have these pat downs, very similar to machines at the airports. He goes on to say, when we have two Canadians unjustly detained in Canada. So I'm going to roll you a video from Rachel Harder asking the same point during question period. Partisanship isn't going to change that. For Lethbridge. 
The Liberal government seems to have blinders on when it comes to China. Canada has remained silent while China's communist regime is systematically attacking the Uyghur people. Canada is the only member of the Five Eyes Alliance that has not banned Huawei. And now Canada is awarding a Chinese government-owned firm a $6.8 million contract to supply security equipment to our embassies. The only thing necessary for evil to triumph is that good men do nothing. When will the Prime Minister stop pandering and stand up to China? The Honourable Minister. Speaker, I welcome the question by my colleague. Let me be very clear for Canadians. No contract has been awarded to New Tech, Mr. Mr. Speaker, at this time. And I've been very specific with the Department. I've been asking the facts and figures surrounding that contract. I've asked that we review our purchasing practices when it comes to security equipment, and I've asked the Department to continue our review of security in all our missions around the world. Let's be very clear, Mr. Speaker, with Canadians. No purchase has been made. So there you have that exchange between one of my colleagues, the Minister. So let's go over some of the facts of this particular contract. So first of all, it's a state-owned company. It's called Nuk Tech, founded in 1997 by the son of former Chinese President Hu Jintao. Uh, the government of Canada awarded a contract estimated to be worth $6.8 million to the state-owned company to supply equipment. 170 embassies will get the security equipment. It's an X-ray conveyor uh, belt style machine. Um, they haven't purchased any machines. That's what we found out already. We asked the question again today. They, this is the hook that the government's defending itself on. Uh, they don't have a single machine yet purchased in our embassies. It's a great question to ask, you know, how could we be doing business with state-owned Chinese companies when uh, they're holding Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor still for trumped-up charges in uh, the People's Republic of China unfairly uh, for absolutely no reason. And now they have these charges of espionage that they're, they've levied against them. Nuktek is known as the Huawei of airport security, supplies X-ray machines, it supplies scanners, explosion, explosive detection uh, systems to airports and custom offices in over 160 countries. James, if you fly as often as I do, it's quite possible you've gone through one of these machines and it was a Nuktek machine, but it's a fair point. We're already on it. We're fighting to ensure that this contract is canceled. There's absolutely no reason we should be doing with business with state-owned companies that have tight links to Beijing. Um, I have no problems of Canadians doing business with Chinese companies as long as they're not state-owned companies. I think that's where we need to seriously draw the line. So, moving on to the next question from Alexander. Will you support investments into nature in order to help Canadians' physical and mental health? Will you reaffirm commitment to protect 25% of Canada's lands and fresh water? Um, I think what we could be doing to help people with actual mental health issues is to ensure that they have access to specialists over the phone, teleconferencing, texting, video conferencing. The Alberta government is rolling out an entire suite of mental health services that people can take advantage of, especially during this viral pandemic. We don't have as much interaction with people. Um, I think it's really important for our public health officials to be providing more services, a greater amount of services, so that people can have interactions with public health professionals. Um, there's already $53 million for COVID-19 mental health plan announced in April to help Albertans. Um, with a $343 billion deficit, Alexander, I don't know whether now is the right time to be setting aside any money uh, for these, these um, environmental commitments. I also don't see how doing this will actually help the environment. I, I'd much rather see more national parks better management of the national parks to ensure that more people can enjoy the outdoors, go hiking and enjoy time outdoors. So Alexander, we're gonna disagree, I think, about how we achieve the same goals on that. Wendy asks me the question, tell us in plain terms how we can depose Trudeau. Lots of talk, but no real defensive plan. So constitutionally, and I have a note on my Facebook page, you can go read it. It's uh, on non-confidence motions. We're not allowed to move a non-confidence motion right now because of the suspension of parliament. That was the bloc and the NDP working together. The NDP actually voted for this with the federal government, with the federal liberals. So we can't move a non-confidence motion. Now that uh, the federal liberal support levels are actually going down, it's quite possible that a non-confidence motion could win. It might happen even as early as this fall. But Wendy, uh, you can't depose Trudeau. He's not a dictator. Uh, he's the Prime Minister of Canada. 
I'm going to encourage you to get involved in the political civic process. Volunteer for your local political party of your choice. I'm a conservative MP. I believe people should back the conservative party. You can volunteer, you can get involved locally, you can talk to your neighbors, talk to your co-workers, talk to people you know from all across the country who maybe voted in the past for the Liberals and remind them that the Liberals promised to run small itty bitty little deficits of $10 billion and have a surplus in 2019. They didn't do that. They messed up the country's finances, they ran tens of billions of dollars of deficit every single year, they inherited an actual surplus of $1.4 billion in 2015 and threw it all away. It's by getting involved in the civic process, by you know volunteering, going door to door, having civil conversations with fellow Canadians to convince them to stop voting for the Liberals and kick them out of office. Once the Liberals see that they're sagging poll numbers, they're going to do it themselves. They've done it in the past. They've gotten rid of Michael Ignati of that way. They got rid of Stefan Dion that way. And they won't get rid of their leaders once they prove unpopular. And who knows, that might happen sooner rather than later. So I'm going to encourage you to get involved in the political process, in the civic democratic process in Canada, because that's the way we're going to make real change in Canada. I spent a great many weekends campaigning and other writings all across Canada uh, in my last term in office. Uh, you know, I took time during the summer to do this, uh, to visit other parts of the country and to make sure that I convinced people that it was time to vote for the Conservatives and we succeeded. We reduced the previous Liberal majority to a minority situation right now. I would have thought the Liberals would have humbled themselves, but that's the way to affect real change. Um, I, I don't think we should be using uh, language like, you know, deposing uh, Trudeau. It'll only happen through a non-confidence motion. It'll only happen... Uh, if if uh, people stop voting for liberals and say so to pollsters when they get called at home and there's a, a groundswell of support for a different political party. Moving on to the next question. Uh, Jennifer actually asked me the question, is it true the liberals and CMHC are planning a new tax on homeowners? I asked this question yesterday, Jennifer. It's on my uh, Facebook page already. Both the CMHC CEO and the Minister of Finance for once actually answered a direct question with a direct answer saying absolutely not. They're not looking at either a capital gains tax or a home equity tax. The problem here is can you really believe them? And this is where I have issues with them. Uh, can you believe what they have to say? This is the same government that attacks small businesses, called them tax cheats. This is the same government that uh, in August 2017 rolled out an attack on professional corporations or doctors used to get paid. They attacked farm businesses. Um, it's hard to believe people when in their 2019 Ontario caucus priorities plan, they called for the taxation, a capital gains tax on primary residences. And as of just a few years ago, the Canada Revenue Agency started to collect information on whether you sold your primary residence in the previous tax year. So they say no, they're categorically against, but they spent $250,000 uh, on a study that looks exactly at different tax options to try and level the playing field between renters and homeowners. And then they called homeowners, the same group that they gave $250,000 to, they called them uh, lottery winners. And so I think there's serious problems at the CMHC when they don't, can't even control where the money is going. So Jennifer, I've actually filed 20 different access to information requests to get to the truth and I'll provide them online so that everybody else can see the information that I get back. That would be my answer on it. Alexander asks me the question on Remdesivir is one of the new drugs that has shown to help with COVID-19. Will you stand up to President Trump who has bought the entire supply of this drug? So Remdesivir in FDA trials is the first drug approved by licensing authorities in the United States to treat COVID-19. It's made by Gilead, a company which has uh, production and manufacturing facilities in Edmonton and shown to help people actually recover from a condition faster. Uh, Gilead said just a few uh, weeks ago that Health Canada is seeking an expedited regulatory approval and review of Remdesivir for COVID-19. And there's also global trial data that's being submitted. Once it's available, uh, CADETH, so HDA, the Health Technology Assessment done by Health Canada, they'll expedite it and see whether it'll be approved in Canada. Canada is one of the longest regulatory approval processes in the world. So it's not for approval in Canada yet. The United States has purchased 
uh, the entire supply for July, 90% of the supply for August, and the supply for in September as well. That's over 500,000 doses. So Alexander, I am going to disagree with you on po one point because you say to stand up to Trump. But you got to understand that if the federal government uh, stepped in right now and seized all of the entire supply, uh, there's nothing stopping uh, the United States administration from basically seizing the patent or making it completely open to everybody. In the case of Gilead, it might have huge impact on their bottom line, their employees, their workers, and any future work they might be doing uh, on other cures, other therapies for COVID-19 and other drugs. Uh, I don't think this is a situation where you want to see governments seizing a supply of uh, manufactured pharmaceuticals, especially since it's not even approved for use in Canada just yet. Now, I think we should move expeditiously for the approval right away, and we have to ensure that obviously it meets our own safety standards. So we have an agreement with the United States, you know, it falls under COSMA, it falls under NAT, NAT, whatever you want to call it, NAFTA 1.5, if you wish. And, you know, we recognize each other's patents. Now, the health minister does have the right during this pandemic, it ends September 30th, uh, these new special authorities. Uh, the health minister has the authority to break a patent, and then it can basically uh, provide it to anybody to manufacture uh, the Gilead drug uh, Remsidivir anywhere in Canada. Uh, my problem would be, uh, in this particular situation, if we try to seize it from Gilead, I'm sure the company can expand production in Canada, and I'm sure they would be willing to do so if there was someone willing to purchase. I think it points to the failure of the federal government to plan better, to plan uh, manufacturing production facilities. This is why we created the Public Health Agency of Canada after the 2003 SARS crisis, uh, to respond to a pandemic. Why didn't we have uh, production facilities, manufacturing facilities uh, in, in, uh, in the wait, you know, so to speak, kind of mothballed, waiting to be used at a moment's notice for the production of uh, a patented medication or a generic that would be able to create enough doses for Canadian patients. Why isn't this more expedited? Why does it take weeks to get during a pandemic, have this approved. Uh, so there's a lot of questions to be asked here. Why did the government drop the ball so quickly? Now, the United States government invested very heavily into Gilead to also secure these doses. So it's another question to ask the government. Why didn't they do the same thing? Why didn't they intervene earlier to provide Gilead more certainty and to secure more of those doses for Canadian patients? There's a million and one questions to ask here and not after the fact and look at uh, what the American government has done to secure doses for themselves. And of course, the Canadian government still has their authority if it needs to do so once the approvals are got are, are received from Health Canada and it does indeed work um, to then secure it for Canadian patients and to secure contracts with Gilead for the manufacturer in Canada. Uh, the next question is from Michael. The people who painted statues in Toronto should be charged regardless of what organization they're with. Does Canada not have laws against this? So Michael, yes, Canada does have laws against this very thing. Uh, there are laws against vandalism of um, private property. Uh, they're being applied in this situation. The individuals were charged with vandalizing statues. Three of them were charged. They have been let go on bail right now. Uh, the group that did this, uh, they said it was a necessary intervention. I don't agree with them. I don't believe in destroying or damaging public statues. You, the taxpayer, you, the citizen, has to pay for these statues uh, to be to be fixed. Uh, paint has been thrown on the Sir John and McDonald statue and, and of the statue of firefighters and policemen in Calgary. Uh, we should be debating whether you know it makes sense for you know, uh, these statues to be out in the public. I think they do. I think there's a strong case to be made. Uh, Sir John A. Macdonald is the founder of our country. Without Sir John A. Macdonald, there would be no country. Was he a racist? He said a lot of very racist things in his time. Uh, does that say that we can't put a plaque right next to it, explain the full history of his accomplishments and his downside? Um, there are many books that have been written about his contributions to Canada, his ideas, how Canada was formed, but if there was no Sir John A. Macdonald, there was no Canada. It's just that simple to put. I don't think people should be vandalizing our statues. I think there's a, a place and a time for public debate on who we should be honoring with statues and sh who should we not be honoring uh, with statues. 
and I'm willing to have it anytime, any day of the week. Um, there's also a place for free speech, but free speech uh, shouldn't be used to damage public property. There's absolutely no excuse for that, and I don't support it at all. But the people in this particular situation, Michael, have been charged with offenses. The last question I'm going to take is from Don. Tom, what is the point of question period asking the liberals questions on we, the we charity, if they have shown they are far from honorable and won't tell the truth? So that's a great question, Don, and that's one of the questions I get periodically. So what's the point of all this talk if nothing ever happens? Well, but things do happen. So there's an ethics commissioner investigation going on. We're trying to get the lobbying commissioner to investigate we on why didn't they get lobbying registry. And there are real penalties to companies and organizations who don't get registered with the lobbying commissioner for it. There are bank, bank covenants that uh, the We Charity violated. They have over $40 million in property assets, real estate assets in Toronto, in a very nice part of Cabbage Town, which I'm told is a very nice area of Toronto. Um, there's a lot of good questions to be asked in question period, and they can be held to account. A minister can be found in contempt of parliament if they knowingly misled parliament. And that's the story that's being formed. And just like it, people during the sponsorship scandal, way back in 2003 when it started, and it ended in 2006 with the Gomery inquiry, um, this is the same thing. This is the same starting point that we found find ourselves in. All the questioning that happened then led to the formation of the Gomery Inquiry and it convinced Canadians not to trust the Liberals because they're a corrupt party. And we thought at one point that they had cleaned themselves up, but they haven't. It's the same old party and nothing has changed. Uh, the, the Liberals have spent a prodigious amount of money that you know citizens in good faith said you know they should be given the right to spend in order to respond to the massive shutdown of the free economy that the government was imposing on businesses. But as we see now, the government also took the opportunity to reward their cronies. And that's not and that's wrong. That's dishonorable. And I think it's dishonorable as well. But it's through asking the questions, forcing the follow up a committee, and we have the two other opposition parties on side. So this isn't a situation, and especially in a minority, where we can't extract the information out of them. Every time a committee meets, we get more info. And Don, they're already on the run. They even filibustered the ethics committee so they could avoid a vote to force people to come before committee. And we're not going to let them go. We're going to force the prime minister's family to come before the committee to answer on these high paying speaking fees that they're getting. And if need be, we'll force more ministers to come to, before the committee and we will get the truth will provide as much information to the public so that you, Don, and other citizens of our country can make a judgment call on the corruption in the Liberal Party. So that brings our town hall to a close. That was the last question for tonight. Thank you very much for joining me. Hit the like button if you like this on YouTube or on Facebook. Click the share button to share with as many constituents as possible so they can hear the questions, hear my answers, and judge my performance tonight. And as well, I want to make sure that uh, I ask you, if you have any other questions, put them down in the comment section. Put the name of somebody you know on Facebook or has uh, uh, an account on YouTube. Just write out their name so they will get the prompt and the notification they can join too. Thanks very much for tuning in and see you next time. Thank you for joining us tonight for our Facebook Live Digital Hangout. Have a very good night.